Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. If you did not bring your physical Bible, you can go get your device out. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, which we just read. I'm going to go through the sections and we'll bounce around a little bit. Um, But I want to remind you where we've been. See, Paul, the apostle, spent chapter 2 saying how it was faith, not works, that justified us. The faith, not works, that made us right with God. That's what justification means. Now we're in chapter 3, and Paul is saying that how it is faith that sanctifies us, how it grows us to be right with God. And so what I want for this morning is for us, our roots to go down deep in the Lord, Uh, as we submit to the Holy Spirit and listen to the Lord, that God would do something today. Um, You know, every week when I share from God's word, I never know what he does. It's always so great to hear from people how God is speaking to them. But you know what? It's God. And so it's you coming this morning with the expectation. Say, Lord, teach me something. Lord, stir something in my heart. Lord, convict me of something. Lord, show me where I'm blind. So as you come with that spirit and that heart, I believe God's going to use his simple word to preach and to teach and to shape you uh, more into his likeness this morning. And so when we look at his word, I want our roots to go down deep and see what Paul is doing. He's writing this urgent letter. He is sending a warning. And he says to these believers in Galatia, there's been a huge misunderstanding. Now, this is a a text that a, a woman received on her phone. It said this, I'm here for you. She texted back, thanks. I'm going through a tough time and that means a lot. And then she said, I'm sorry, I lost all my contacts. Who is this? And the text came back, it's your Uber driver. I'm here to pick you up. (laughs) You ever had a huge misunderstanding, a miscommunication in your life? Paul, if you look at verse one, says there's been a misunderstanding. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? A huge misunderstanding from these believers that Paul had personally uh, led to faith, had planted these churches. This is reminiscent of chapter one. Take a look at that later this week. Paul is shocked that they have misunderstood the simple gospel of Jesus plus nothing else. That's all they need. He's shocked that they're turning away to these Judaizers, these religious leaders, these false leaders who are leading them astray to add religious laws to their spirituality if they wanted to be close to God. And then Paul goes on in verse one. He says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, little side note here. I actually don't think what Paul is saying is that they literally saw Jesus on the cross. What he is saying is that the gospel was so vivid to you. Your reception of the gospel was, was so evident. How can you forget all that you've gone through? How can you forget the grace you received? How can you forget the simple gospel of Jesus? You don't need to add anything to it for you to keep your salvation. See, more than just a mental assent of the facts of believing the right things, that Jesus died and rose again, which is true. Of course, that's the facts of the gospel. See, but Paul is saying that these Galatian believers had this radical Jesus moment, this radical Jesus experience in the power of the Spirit that led them to know Jesus as Lord. And you're going to see Paul talk about the importance of the cross later in this chapter. I like how the late John Stott says it. He says, there is then, it is safe to say, no Christianity without the cross. See, if the cross is not central to our religion, ours is not the religion of Jesus. Paul's going to spend chapter three getting us Christians and these Galatians Christians refocused on the simple fact and the reality of the cross and how that transforms everything when you give your life to Jesus And in the book of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus took this cross. It says, for the joy set before him. So what that means is that Jesus approached the suffering of the cross with joy in his heart. And you wonder why. I like to think it's because Jesus thought about you. He thought about me. And he thought about how we'd be separated for eternity from the love of the Father, the love of the Son, and the Spirit. And because of that separation, the cross with all of its suffering and all of its pain looked like joy because he knew it would bring you closer to him. You know, maybe that's the only thing you'll hear this morning. And he, Hey, I'm out, <laughs> Pastor Tim, I'm done. That's all you need to hear. To remember the simple truth 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ that centers around the cross, that he took the cross with joy. He doesn't want to see you, me, or anyone in this world separated from him for eternity. And so the cross, Jesus says, that's a joy. I would do it again. I would do it again for you. Let that sink in as we take a look at what Paul says about this gospel. See, Paul then goes in verses two through five to show them their illogical thinking. We're not gonna have time to go through every single verse, but Paul sets up a bunch of rhetorical questions to show them how they have this huge misunderstanding of the gospel. In fact, Paul references the Holy Spirit three times in this section. I think he's emphasizing the new life that's in Christ. He's not talking about religion. He's not talking about just believing right things. He's talking about the life, the powerful life that's in Christ through the power of the Spirit. I also think Paul is alluding to that their conversion coming to Christ that happened probably within a year or two of Paul writing this letter. It was marked by some kind of significant experience, something that was noticeable in their lives, a life change. Some of you, I don't know your story, but for many of you or some of you, you coming to Christ was a radical life change. Change your relationship, change the way you thought about yourself, change the way you spent your money, change the way that you uh, encountered life itself. It just changed everything for some of you. And I think what Paul is saying to the Galatians, don't you remember you had some, that radical experience that was clear to you that you encountered Christ? And probably Paul was even thinking of some supernatural experience, something that the New Testament talks about a lot, that maybe some of you have an experience about speaking in tongues, a supernatural experience of the Holy Spirit, of prophetic words, of God speaking directly to people and through people and experiences, or maybe a, mir- a miracle. Some of you have experienced a miraculous touch of God in your life. So I think Paul is referencing Galatians. Don't you remember? This is basically what he's saying. Don't you remember that before these false teachers ever came and told you you weren't spiritual enough? Don't you remember the powerful experience you had in the spirit? And then he basically is saying this. So when were you saved? Were you saved once these false teachers came? Or was it years before when we had these experiences together and I taught you the simple gospel and we know the answer. Well, of course it was when the spirit came, not when these legalistic leaders came. And so Paul is trying to get them to see that their faith was already alive before the Judaizers let them astray. In verse two, Paul says, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? You're gonna hear that word again and again, faith, 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 faith. Was it the works or was it faith? And we know the answer. It was faith. It was the spirit. It was the love of God. It wasn't my effort. And again, our reformed tradition as Presbyterians, we love leaning on these kind of ancient uh, theories and thoughts and doctrine, which is this, that the salvation that comes is by grace through faith alone. It's that's what makes you justified. That's what makes you right with God. The simple gospel of grace through faith. But it is faith that also makes you sanctified, not just justified, making you right with God, makes you sanctified, that makes you grow right with God. So that means that the gospel, you never leave it behind. The gospel, yes, crosses you over the line into salvation, but the gospel in your daily life keeps you growing right with God. Not that you're going to lose your salvation, but the gospel that gets you saved is the same gospel that grows you in the right relationship with God. Faith is the thing that gets you justified and the faith in the gospel will keep you growing and sanctified. You never leave it behind. It isn't just to get you saved. And so, and then in verse six, then Paul moves into this section, these next several verses, talking about Abraham. And you got to keep in mind that these Judaizers were super Jewish experts and telling these Galatian Christians, unless you become more Jewish, you can't be close to God. And Paul is thinking, well, what can I do to show them that that's a total lie? Well, I'm going to go to the father of all the Jews. I'm going to go to the big daddy. That's what his name means, Abraham. Big daddy. I'm going to go to the big daddy and show you if, if Abraham himself didn't need anything but faith, neither do you. You don't need to add all this extra stuff. And verse six is Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so when was Abraham declared righteous? The moment he believed God by faith before he ever obeyed. You gotta let that sink in. Before he ever became a good 
Jewish person. Before he ever, ever obeyed God's command to leave his country and go to this other place. He became righteous when? Before he did anything. It was by faith. Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6, and he reintroduces Abraham, the father of all the Jews, to refute these Jewish leaders about, he had to add these religious Jewish laws. So Paul is saying, you Galatians, you Christians are fools for replacing the true and simple gospel of Jesus plus nothing with this false one that these Judaizers are telling you that not even Abraham believed, not even your father, father, your great, 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 great super grandfather believed that it's Jesus plus circumcision, it's Jesus plus being kosher, it's Jesus plus religious duty, it's Jesus plus Judaism. So Paul is shocked Foolish Galatians, my friends, my beloved, why are you giving in to this false belief? It's Jesus plus nothing. It's the gospel that got you saved. It's the gospel that got you right with God. It's the gospel that will keep you right with God. It's the gospel that justifies you. It's the gospel that sanctifies you. You don't need anything added to make your faith in Christ legitimate. Just as Abraham was saved by faith, not by works, so are you. And I will say that to you sitting here and listening at home as well. You are not saved by doing anything good. You are simply saved by grace through faith. That's credited to you before you ever obeyed God. But guess what? Once you let that gospel sink in, you want to obey God. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. I want to sacrifice for you because we are already secure in our salvation. You're saved by faith, not by adding anything else. And then going through verses seven through 10, Paul says this, know then that it is those of faith, you're gonna see that word again and again, who are the sons of Abraham. You wanna be true children of God? It's not following religious rules. It's your faith that you are in the family of God. That's it. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, there's that word again, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul is saying, foolish Galatians, it's not by works, it's by faith. Paul is saying to us through the spirit, through the, the power of God this morning, don't be a foolish Christian and replace the gospel with anything but you resting in the grace of God. Don't, re don't replace Anything that I'm saying to make you think you, you have to give more for God to like you. Uh, you got to get more religious for God to like you. You, get, you have to live in a certain place for God to like you. You got to be sit in certain skin color for God to like you. No, no, no. God made you and loves you as you are. But you need to put your faith in his grace expressed through the cross. You become a son, a daughter of Abraham. Look at verses Verses 10 through 11, Paul is going to lean into this idea of righteousness that comes through faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified, there's that word, before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. Let's let that sink in again. You are declared right with God when you believe in Jesus' work on the cross. He points it back to this cross that those who are cursed, right? Cursed, he's talking about Jesus, who are under the curse, but Jesus who freed us from this curse. Abraham is declared right with God before he ever acted in obedience. And he, it was because he was declared righteous through faith that in God that he obeyed. It was first declared righteous and then he obeyed. So the gospel says it's not what you do, it's what Christ has done. It's what Christ has already done on the cross. See, God is ready to embrace any who put their faith in him and not in their own efforts. We're saved by faith in Christ alone, not our good resume, not by what you've done, not by what you've accomplished, not by your religiosity, not by your church attendance, not by your sincere efforts, as wonderful and good as those are. That's not what saves you. It's not even what keeps you saved. It's the goodness of God. It's the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, not even the level of our faith. It's him. It's not us. See, no one can take away our salvation, not even ourselves, because we never earned it. We, we never secured it. God secured it for us. 
And if he did it, we can't lose it. And that's super important to remember. You see, because we, we are all too sinful to contribute to our own salvation. And that's a really, really good thing. We never contributed to it because it's a perfect God who has given us everything. We're all in need of rescue. I gave that example a few weeks ago. We were all lost at sea, and God not only rescued us, we were drowned. <laughs> he pulled us out of the water, and he resuscitated us. That's, how much, that's much, how much we had to do with our own rescue. We didn't even reach up to God and pull ourselves out of the water. He scooped, out our, uh, uh, scooped up our lifeless body out of the water, resuscitated us, and said, you're mine. You're saved. See, it doesn't matter if you're religious or irreligious. It doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal. We are all desperately in need of God's grace. We are all desperately distant from this perfect God. You know, my story, I remember, I'd gone to church for years, went to a wonderful Bible-believing church, and I was on a church retreat as a freshman. I remember I was riding in the bus, um, and I remember turning around, talking to this one church leader. She was a wonderful leader, and she, I was telling her how hard it was to read my Bible, and how, like, I know I'm supposed to be praying every day, and that's really hard, too, and it's kind of boring, and I fall asleep, and because I never do that anymore, but... I was at back then, you know, I was like really worried. I told her I'm going to lose my salvation. I was really concerned. And she said, Tim, you realize that's not how it works. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, it, you don't have to read your Bible every day and pray every day. You're, no, you're not going to lose your salvation. It's secure. You don't have to do anything to keep saved. I remember thinking like, no, that can't, that's way too easy. It can't be that easy. And it wasn't until a couple years later at a different retreat. I was at Hume Lake, and I heard this great speaker, but it wasn't because of the speaker, and I heard this great band, and it wasn't because of the band. I was just praying with the Lord. And I didn't normally pray, didn't really know how to pray, but I'd been a Christian for a number of years in my mind. I'd gone to church for a number of years. But as I sat there, just all sunk in that, you know what? God loves me. I don't have to do anything to earn his love. It just sunk in. It was like the Holy Spirit was just speaking to me. I don't have to do anything to be loved by him. I'm just, I just am. And the spirit just spoke to me. I could just rest in the reality of God's love. You know what? From that day on, I've wanted to serve him. From that day on. I, I can't really quite explain it, but that was a moment in my life where I just knew I didn't have anything to lose. It was already secure. I didn't have to keep trying, but guess what? I wanted to serve him because I rested in the reality of God's grace. I knew I was deeply loved and can rest in Jesus. And I've tried to serve him ever since, not perfectly. And I even sometimes fall asleep while I'm praying. Oh no, the pastor said that, yes. I, get, I can get bored reading the Bible. I'm not always perfect with my children and they're watching right now in front. Close, yeah, no, but. I'm imperfect too. But you know what? I don't serve the Lord. I don't obey him because I have to in order to not lose his love. I can't lose it. I never earned it. It's unlosable, untakeable way. I can't take away what God has given. God's stronger than me. He's even stronger than your doubts. That's a beautiful reality. I can't out-doubt God's grace. I can't out-sin God's grace. I'm secure in his love. I want us to take a look back as we focus on this idea of righteousness through faith. I'm going to take, back, take a look back at verse 3 really quickly. Paul says, he says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? And I love that word. He uses this word perfected, which has this idea of a, attaining the goal, which is this idea of completion. Why are you trying to find completion to be complete outside of Jesus, the simple gospel? Paul is rebuking their attempts to attain righteousness through effort, of trying to be complete through their own striving. And that's a question we must ask ourselves. How are we striving to try to make my life complete? What's that thing that we think is missing in my life? I just had that. But my family looked like that. If I had that kind of partner, if I had that kind of resume, if I had that, then my life would be complete. 
What are we striving for in life to make ourselves feel complete? See, before we became Christians, we had all kinds of strategies. I had these two in order to feel complete. Maybe you excelled in sports and you thought sports will help me feel complete. Or maybe your pursuit of money you thought would help you feel complete. Or maybe your pursuit of being important would make you feel powerful, make you feel secure. And people will say nice things about you and respect you would make you feel complete. Or maybe you want to make sure people said good things about you because you were a good person or an impressive to make you feel complete. You want to feel respected, feel loved, feel missed. Or maybe your appearance has been really important to you. And maybe you had a time in your life because of your diet and because of DNA and because of products that you could make your appearance look amazing and you would feel complete when you looked in the mirror. That's never happened to me, but maybe for you, that was like a moment in your life. And the reality is, no matter, even if that was a moment in your life, you'll lose it. Anything that makes you feel complete outside of Christ will eventually be lost. That's the brokenness of our world. What do you strive for to make yourself feel complete? Now, here's the thing. Even Christians can be foolish like these Galatians. And even if we are secure in the gospel, we try to make ourselves feel complete by adding something else to Jesus. Even Christians do this. Good things that make us feel complete. So what are your strategies to make your life feel complete? I'll give you a silly example. When I was seven, I remembered one Christmas. I was convinced. I remember this very clearly. If I got that G.I. Joe truck for Christmas, my life's complete. Best day ever. Best life ever. I got that G.I. Joe truck. I proclaimed it. I'm done. Uh, That's all I need to be complete. (laughs) And then time went on about a week. And that toy got a little old. And then I got into high school and I thought, if if that girl liked me, then I'll be complete. That's that's what's missing. I got everything else going on. But if that girl or any girl liked me, (laughs) then I will be complete. And then maybe I was able to secure that. And then I was like, well, maybe if I was just taller, because if I was taller, obviously there'd be more girls that like me because it's really a height thing. It's not a face thing, obviously. It's got to be a height thing. More girls will like me. I'll be better in sports. I could finally join the volleyball team, right? (laughs) If I just, if I, and here's the funny thing. No matter how old you get, it's just going to be something new. If I just had that, I would be complete. And even us Christians, we give in. Even us who know the gospel, that we're already complete in Christ. He's already done all the work. There's nothing we can add to our resume to impress him anymore. We don't need to impress anyone anymore. I love uh, verse three. What it implies is this idea that you'll never find how your story was meant to end unless you seek the person who is writing your story which means this, well, you need to center your life around the cross of Jesus Christ and what he did for you on that cross because it is a grace that is never earned. It was a grace you cannot lose and that completes you. It's a gospel that only justifies you. It's a gospel that sanctifies you and you can live life each day with joy and live life each day with hope. Even in the midst of a pandemic, you can have joy and hope because you find that you are complete in Christ not in your circumstances, not in mass or not mask, or who wins an election. You are complete in Christ, not based on our circumstances. God wants you to know you're complete in him. He wants you to renew your faith in him and learn and remember who you are, that you are in Christ. You know, a lovely thing happened last week. Pastor Luke mentioned it, that a youth came to know Christ last week. It was a beautiful moment crossed over that threshold of faith, grace through faith in Christ and justified. And here's a beautiful thing. That same gospel is going to keep that young man secure and growing in Christ. You never leave it behind. The gospel that saves you is a gospel that grows you. Remember that we are complete through this same and simple gospel. You don't have to add anything to Jesus plus nothing. You can daily rest in Christ's saving work, which means you are already complete in him. You never leave it behind. So I ask you again, what are you looking to complete yourself? You know what happens? You meet someone. Here's a normal thing you do. You ask them, oh, what do you do? 
oh, doctor, lawyer, retired, entrepreneur, artist. Really, we're kind of getting, are you important or not important? Or <laughs> should I get your number or not get your number? Kind of we fish around sometimes for that. Naturally, the conversation might turn to a different question, something like this, what do you, what do you have? Well, what does that mean? Well, where did you go to school? Or what did you study? Did you, do you own or do you rent? Start figuring out kind of their place in this world. Did you, uh, what city do you live in? What's your zip code? Because different zip codes better than another zip code, right? What, 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 what do you have? Do you have a degree from USC, like my wife Katie, or from the best school on the planet, UCLA? Which one? Which, which one do you have, right? We ask those questions almost unconsciously. Because if you don't have the right car, if you don't have the right home or right job, then our world tells us you aren't complete. Because in today's culture, you'll be labeled a failure if you don't have the right stuff, right? That's not what the Bible says, but this whole world will tell you, you have not found what makes life worth living if you don't have these things. You know, lastly, another thing that comes up you interact with people. You know, what do people say about you? Do people say you're smart or enlightened? Do people say that you're a failure behind your back, a disappointment, or maybe even to your face? What do people say about you? You know, you probably remember a time recently when someone said something nice about you. Hope you can think of that person. But you also, if I asked you, can you think of someone who criticized you recently? Like, well, yeah, I remember what I was wearing, the time of day, what I ate that morning. I don't know what it is about critique and criticism, what people say, when they say bad things about us, it just sears. And see, God wants his voice to be a bigger voice than what do you have, what do you do, what do people say about you? He says, let me say, answer all three questions. You have me. You serve me. You find yourself in me. I call you my beloved. That's who you are. Listen to me, listen to my voice. Because we'll always be running after these affirmations if we don't rest in Christ. I remember even being in school. I remember, I remember rejection. I remember, I remember especially, I always wanted someone to ask me to be on the basketball team. I never could figure out why. No one ever asked me. This eluded me. I'm athletic. I'm, I'm quick. I, I make good decisions. I never was asked. That's those little kind of rejections, right? But we have these kind of rejections all the time. So we can't listen to the world that tells us who we are. Because maybe you're like me and you can't seem to make any progress towards some important goal in your life. Yeah, even Pastor Tim, I got my direct line to God, right? I'm a pastor. I have tons of things, unfinished, unaccomplished, unanswered prayers. And I can beat myself up over these failures. And you can too. Oh, but if you hear the real voice of God, he's saying, you're complete in me. Rest in me. But maybe one or more of these disappointments, they hit us and bitterness can set in. And we need to release those to the Lord. See, because we want approval and it gets blocked and we become angry inside. Why can't I have this, God? And sometimes we realize we've made like a secret deal with God that God, I'll follow you as long as you keep answering my prayers. Or God, I'm going to keep being faithful to you as long as the way I see you working in my life is clear enough to me, right? Then I'll keep being faithful to you. If things are clear. We have these secret deals we make with God that as long as my life improves, I'll keep following you. So let me ask you, are you disappointed with God in some way? You feel like he's let you down? I want you to be able to take those things to the Lord and to bring him to him, and to say, Lord, it's hard for me to follow you. It's hard for me to believe in you right now. I feel far from you. I'm struggling. COVID, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with divisions in our world. I'm struggling. We take those to the Lord. See, God doesn't promise to answer every one of our prayers or give you everything that you want. Doesn't do it for me either. But he promises to be present and to give you what you need. You have faith as you go into your week to don't leave the gospel and God's good word behind. You may not get everything that you want. You might be waiting for a prayer to be answered still, a goal to be accomplished. But God has not abandoned you. I want us to wrap up on verse 13 before we take communion together. Paul says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. See, this picture of the cross becomes so clear. 
Paul's trying to get the Galatians, the foolish Galatians, to get back to the simple gospel, the truth of the cross, what Christ did. Because on the cross, Christ took our bad resume and gave us his perfect one. And so we get rewarded with eternal security of his perfect love beginning right now. That's what the cross does. And so Paul brings it back to the cross that Jesus took the blame, that he took our condemnation so that we wouldn't have to have that condemnation. And he's just simply reminding us today through the same word, 2,000 years later, don't forget the cross. Don't forget what Jesus has done. Don't forget who you are. You're already complete in him. You don't have to worry about your record. You don't have to worry about if you're secure. Rest in that security. Live faithfully for him. You see, he took our condemnation so we wouldn't have to. He came to show how significant our lives could be if we would surrender ourselves to his good plan. You see, on the cross, Christ became forgotten so we could be eternally remembered. Remember how Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people translate that, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me? That Christ took on a temporary forgottenness as he became sin, the Bible says, as he became cursed, as verse 13 says, so that you would never be forgotten. So you would be released from the curse. So you would not be condemned. See, for most of us, our worst nightmare is actually not to be hated, but forgotten. See, if you're hated, at least people remember you, right? <laughs> if someone hates you, at least you're, you're kind of in, in their world. The worst thing is to be forgotten. It's feeling invisible. It's feeling insignificant. It's feeling negligible, meaning like if I woke up today, no one even care. That's the worst feeling in the world. I've felt that before when I didn't rest in the grace of God. See, no matter how much you've achieved in this world, each of us are cursed to be forgotten. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes I like to go through the paper online or actual physical paper, and I read the obituaries. I do. And sometimes I think, gosh, when I die, is anyone going to put an ad in the paper for me? <laughs> like, I wonder, like, is anyone going to still be alive? And I hope so. And how big will the ad be? Like, like, so some in my mind, in my quiet moments, I'll admit to you, I think like, I want like a full page ad. That'd be awesome. And color could be 3D and like be really impressive. That's what my mind thinks because I don't want to be forgotten. That is the most natural human inclination. None of us want to be forgotten. But here's what the Bible says. You're all cursed to be forgotten unless you put your faith in Christ. In Christ, you will never be negligible. You will never be forgotten. Your life becomes eternally significant when you put your faith in him and his work on the cross. For those who put their faith in Christ, you become complete. Your identity to him is all you need. In Christ, you are eternally remembered, never forgotten. You will never be negligible in the eyes of God. Put your faith in him and you'll never be cursed because Christ took the curse, became the curse so that you would never be forgotten. You would always be complete. You know, we come to the table.